Hello, and welcome back to PaleoCast. I'm Liz, and this is episode 92 on the origin of squamates. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Tiago Samoas, who just finished his PhD at the University of Alberta. During his PhD, Tiago traveled around the world to look at a lot of fossils, and I first met him on one of these collection visits in Germany. This large number of fossils put him in a very good position to take a closer look at the relationships of squamates, like snakes and lizards, as well as other reptiles, which led to a pretty interesting new study. This episode is an overview of Tiago's exciting new paper, Hot Off the Press in Nature, so don't forget to check out the images on our website. And as always, I hope you enjoy this episode. So I am here today with Tiago from the University of Alberta, uh, talking about the origin of squamates. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into paleontology and how you ended up at the U of A? Hey, uh, hi Liz, uh, nice to talk to you again. We've known each other for a, a few years now. Yes. Uh, and it's uh, really nice uh, to be talking about this uh, with you. And uh, I basically came into paleontology uh, from my biological sciences undergrad uh, mm -hmm. back home in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, I was doing my biological sciences at, uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. And back home we have the National Museum uh, of Rio de Janeiro, which is associated with that institution, uh, the Federal University where uh, we have uh, actually a large number of paleontologists working there and we have one of they have one of the biggest exhibits uh, for paleontology in Brazil so uh, it's a fairly well-known institution and uh, I always had this particular interest on fossils and studying evolution through fossils uh, so really early in my undergrad I, I went there uh, to ask for uh, uh, an opportunity to do research in paleontology, mm -hmm. and that's uh, how I came into paleontological research. Uh, I actually started to work on uh, marine reptiles there, uh, not squamates, uh, especially ichthyosaurs and uh, sauropter regions. My first paper was actually with a plesiosaur from Antarctica mm -hmm. uh, that they had mm -hmm. recovered on a, an Antarctic expedition in 2007. But then, uh, after that, I, I started to study squamates, especially lizards from the Crato Formation in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, which are the oldest known squamates we know in South America. Uh, and that was for my master's. Mm -hmm. And after that, I, I decided to go even further and deeper into squamate evolution. That's how I ended up coming to Canada to work on early squamate evolution with Dr. Michael Caldwell here at the University of Alberta. So how does a Brazilian end up in Edmonton? <laughs> yes, I, I heard that question a lot lots of times. Yeah, the, the, the weather is quite different from yeah. plus 40 degrees positive, so 40 degrees positive to minus 40 degrees yeah. Celsius. So it's a, a quite drastic change. <laughs> uh, uh, and well, pretty much uh, because of my interest on both marine reptiles and uh, squamates, uh, I was looking uh, for someone uh, who has a uh, long, uh, long established reputation and lots of skills on both groups and different uh, research projects on on kind of both both kind of uh, groups. And uh, uh, Michael Caldwell is actually one of the very few people who actually have uh, a good publication record in both groups. Mm. And I met him in the SVP meeting mm -hmm. uh, in 2011 uh, in uh, Las Vegas. That was my very first SVP meeting, actually. Mm -hmm. And my uh, uh, master's supervisor, Dr. Alexander Kellner, uh, in the National Museum, he introduced me to, to Caldwell mm. and uh, talked about the possibility of a PhD here, and that's uh, pretty much how I eventually actually ended up here. Mm -hmm. And you just finished your PhD, right? 
Yeah, that's right. I finished uh, last April, so now mm. I'm a doctor. Congratulations, yes. doctor. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I guess getting into it, I think the first kind of main question would be, uh, can you explain what squamates are for those of us who don't necessarily work in that area? Sure, no worries. Yeah. Uh, uh, so squamates, they pretty much represent lizards. Uh, so including limbless lizards, mm -hmm. such as snakes. Uh, so commonly we see lizards, snakes, uh, amphibians, and lots of other uh, different kind of lizards with uh, with several different adaptations to several different environments. Uh, so that includes uh, lizards that can uh, run bipedally and even over water, like the basilisk lizard. Uh, in South America, we also have gliding lizards, such as Draco, which is a kind of acrodontan iguanian. We have uh, marine lizards, like the marine iguanian Galapagos. Uh, and we have different kind of uh, ex extinct species and uh, wholly extinct families as well, such as the uh, mosasaurs from the late Cretaceous period, uh, which uh, were large uh, sized marine reptiles, uh, marine lizards specifically speaking, uh, that inhabited the whole uh, world during that time. So uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty much uh, those guys. And where do lepidosaurs fit into these? So, Lepidosaurus is pretty much the name that we give to the group that includes squamates, so that is lizards and snakes and their kind, okay. along with uh, another group called Rhynchocephalians, uh, which pretty much includes the modern Tuatara from New Zealand, mm -hmm. so that's uh, Sphenodon punctatus, this species name, and uh, all of its extinct relatives. Uh, the Rhynchocephalians, they're represented by a single uh, living species, the Sphenodon punctatus, but they have a really rich fossil record in the Mesozoic. And uh, during actually the Triassic and the Jurassic, we have a richer fossil record for Rhynchocephalians than uh, squamates. Okay. So uh, Lepidosaurus is pretty much both groups. Okay. And how are these related to things like crocodiles, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, typical reptile groups? Yes, so that's actually one of the questions I try to answer in my paper, mm -hmm. because uh, for a long time, broad-scale reptile uh, phylogenetic studies, so those are the studies trying to understand the uh, species tree, uh, the composition of the evolutionary tree of reptiles, they have uh, readily included a uh, rich sampling of uh, squamates or rhynchocephalians, so the okay. lipidosaur sampling of those studies was usually pretty uh, mild, let's say, and uh, with a rich representation sometimes of archosaurs, including those uh, species you mentioned, like crocodiles, mm -hmm. uh, dinosaurs, and other stuff. And uh, the problem with that is uh, it, we, we had several different analyses showing very different results, and we had no real understanding of what kind of reptiles were the closest reptiles to lepidosaurs. Mm. Uh, at some point, at one point or another, almost every single group of early reptiles have been to be the closest relatives to okay. lepidosaurs. So, uh, archosaurs for sure, but uh, sometimes more closely related to lepidosaurs than archosaurs. Uh, marine reptiles like the region, so that's the the plesiosaurs, placodonts, and other Triassic uh, uh, marine reptiles. Uh, also, uh, a, a group called uh, young gain forms, which are Permian aquatically adapted reptiles, quite common in uh, South Africa and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had turtles uh, in recent years being proposed to be closely related to lepidosaurs, along with sauropterygians. Uh, so, pretty much, we've had almost everything uh, proposed to be closely related to them. Mm. Uh, so. As part of my big PhD question was to assess which were the actually earliest evolving squamates and uh, uh, which particular groups of other reptile lineages are the closest relatives to lepidosaurs. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, uh, as a result of that, which you, you can see in that paper, uh, is pretty much uh, uh, there is there is uh, uh, no actual consensus. Each different analysis kind of tells a different answer. Okay. But what we can what we can say for sure is that lots of those groups that previously were proposed to actually be their closest relatives are not their closest relatives. Okay. Uh, most of them actually fall in other areas of the reptile tree of life. Mm -hmm. So young guy ferns are really more old. They are much earlier diverging in reptiles. They are not closely related to lepidosaurs. We also have some other taxa that have been previously proposed to be lepidosauromorphs such as Paliguana, Paligama from South Africa, uh, and also uh, Sorosterno. They also fall uh, in most of the analysis uh, that I conducted uh, in my PhD in other areas of, of the uh, reptile tree of life. And uh, in the end, we have uh, uh, pretty much only archosaurs, uh, spe especially uh, archosauri forms, so that's the early forms that eventually uh, gave origin to crocodiles and their like, along with uh, rhynchosaurs, which is an extinct plate of archosauromorphs, mm -hmm. uh, lying as the closest relatives to lepidosaurs. So at least from the, the, the let's say, the most uh, parameter-rich analysis that uh, we conducted, it's pretty much the the closest answer that we have as their closest relatives. Mm. And some other taxa, other species that we thought that were early lepidosaurs, we actually found as to, to be the oldest known squamids. And that includes Megacurella, the main mm -hmm. uh, species we talk about in this paper, mm -hmm. along with uh, the Middle Jurassic Marmoretta from the UK. So it comes from Oxfordshire and the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And both uh, and and both taxa pretty much are now found to be the early squamates, not early lepidosaurs. Um, so, yeah. sorry, going back to this um, mega corella, when yes. and where is that animal from? So that's from the Italian Alps, from the Dolomites mm -hmm. in northern Italy. Uh, this specimen was found in the Monte Prada della Vacca, uh, which is a mountain in, nor in northern Italy. It's mm -hmm. about 25 kilometers eastern of the city of Bolzano. Uh, so it's actually a, a, a quite beautiful place. Uh, <laughs> it's in the middle of the mountains and really beautiful mountains, Bolzano is gorgeous city to visit as well. And uh, uh, the specimen was found really high up in the mountains and uh, uh, it, and it's from a layer uh, of uh, siltstones uh, and it was found with lots of uh, terrestrial plants. Mm -hmm. But actually the sediments come from marine sediments. So pretty much mm. the specimen along with lots of other fragments of terrestrial vertebrates and especially lots of terrestrial plants was actually out into the sea and preserved this special layer uh, which was on the ocean, but which preserved even more terrestrial remains of plants and animals than of marine animals, at mm -hmm. least in that specific layer. And the age of that is uh, early Middle Triassic, uh, okay. the uh, Aesian, so it's about 240 million years ago. So you said that it was previously considered not to be a squamate. What were the reasons of the previous studies of why it wasn't a squamate? So, the previous studies, uh, it, it it was more about they couldn't really find a true answer or a, a reasonable answer to the placement of the species than actually being a squamate. They just didn't have enough data or and uh, 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 specific phylogenetic data set that could address the placement of this particular fossil, which is pretty much the same problem we had with other taxa previously proposed to be lipidosauromorphs. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have a very good 
understanding of where in the Lepidosaur tree of life or in the reptile tree of life, in generally speaking, they would fit. Okay. Uh, so the very first study uh, with the uh, naming of this species in 2003 by Renesto and Posenato, they uh, named the species and provided a description. They uh, identified this as a lipidosaur because of certain features preserved in the skeleton, such as a quadrate conch, uh, the quadrate bone also being marginated, the uh, incomplete lower temporal bar, so that's the jugal not extending to contact the quadrate, quadrate jugal complex, the of a quadrato jugo, uh, according to what they found at the time. So all of those features told uh, what made it clear to them that it was a lipidosaur morph. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, in 2014, uh, Ernesto and Bernardi, they, they published a new paper uh, for the first time actually including this species in a phylogenetic data set to test its phylogenetic relationships, uh, which is the only means that we can accurately try to position uh, any species in the evolutionary tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, they tried several different, but each data set would give them a different answer. Uh, and again, that's a problem that we had until now with several data sets. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, all of them having come on the problem of represent, of having a very weak representation of squamate and other lipidosaurs. So pretty much those analyses they had squamate as a single data point, and it's really difficult to represent a lineage of 10,000 extant species plus hundreds of fossil ones by a single data point, right? So they could not really place it any, anywhere with confidence. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, why the evolutionary relationships of this particular taxon were kind of murky until now. And that's how I came in to providing my PhD data set along with the data collected by Bernardi and some of my other colleagues to actually try to, to, to provide a data set which had enough sampling of every single major lineage of reptiles, including squamates, uh, including, including morphological and molecular data to be able to actually answer uh, not only where this particular species fits into the reptile tree of life, but also other lineages and other uh, species of reptiles of, of highly uh, uh, dubious placements until now. So your new study or your new paper, I haven't actually mentioned this yet, is uh, in nature, <laughs> uh, which is exciting. And obviously, I guess the main draw is you've made this like much larger data set, uh, kind of a larger matrix, including a lot more species than other people have made. So what kind of features have you found that supports this animal actually being a squamate rather than a basal lipidosaur or something else? Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the features uh, that join this particular taxon with squamates, uh, a lot of them were actually obtained after we did the CT scan mm -hmm. uh, oh. of this particular specimen. Uh, some of these other features were actually already visible, such as the shape of the squamosal bone. Mm -hmm. It's a three radiate bone and not a, a four radiate bone as you have in most other reptile lineages and including uh, sphenodontians and rhynchocephalians, broadly speaking, So, which makes them different, different from uh, the other kind of lipidosaurs, pretty much. Uh, but some other features which are quite interesting and very conspicuous to squamates include uh, one feature in case, which, uh, which we call uh, an expanded alar uh, product al uh, ala, which extends anteriorly on the skull. Uh, so that, that's a feature that is common to many squamates, uh, not to iguanas, but to many other squamates. We also have uh, other important features that we uh, found in the, the postcranium, mm -hmm. such as, for instance, the curvature of the clavicle. It has uh, a secondary curvature, as we call it, which is something conspicuous to uh, lots of squamates. Uh, uh, again, not in iguanas, but in several other squamates. And uh, we don't see that in other reptiles. We have the shape of the humerus and the wrist. So the humerus, for instance, uh, it has uh, an expanded radial condyle, which is something uh, other groups have it too, but the combination of that with the clavicles uh, uh, plus 
the other features, mm-hmm. uh, it's something you only find in squamates. And in the wrist, uh, there is something quite important, which is the first metacarpal uh, has an expanded head, uh, and at the same time, you lack one important wrist bone uh, called the medial centrale. Uh, those features are common in squamates because mm. pretty much what happens is you have an autogenetic fusion of that medial uh, centrale to the first metacarpal, creating this expanded head of that bone. So it has a larger head because it's pretty much the fusion of two bones. Uh, and it, we have that in this particular specimen too. So these are some of the features we, we found there. Uh, along with, for instance, the presence of a splenial bone, which again, it's something we could only identify using the CT scan data. Mm. So the splenial is absent in all wrinkles of phalanx including the very earliest ones. Uh, so another reason why it, it should, it, it nests with squamates uh, in our analysis and not with any other lipidosaur. And the CT scans were something unique to your study that hadn't been done in previous studies? Yes. Yeah, we're the first ones who scanned this particular specimen. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so in terms of sort of general large-scale significance what i know you kind of briefly mentioned it before but what is the kind of main significance of megacorella being a squamate and what does this mean for squamate evolution well it pretty much represents the oldest known squamate in a planet okay uh, in the fossil record so uh and it is not the oldest one by a couple of million years it's the oldest one by 70 million years okay so that's a big deal uh, because uh, uh, for two reasons. One is that previous molecular clock studies had already predicted that the origin of squamates should have been way before the oldest known fossil. Hmm. Uh, it should have been in the early or middle Triassic. And, uh, uh, and this is supported by the fossil record in Rhicocephalians, that sister group to lipid to squamates. Yeah. Because the oldest known uh, rhincocephalian comes from the Middle Triassic, and so if they are sister lineages, and the oldest no- known fossil from one group is from the Middle Triassic, that means that the oldest known fossil from the other group should also be from at least the Middle Triassic too. Yeah. Uh, so we already knew that at some point we had to have squamates in the Triassic, uh, in the Middle or Late Triassic specifically. And uh, finding Megacorella specifically in the Middle Triassic pretty much confirms that and uh, uh, that that prediction made from the fossil record and molecular uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second thing is now that we have uh, uh, squamate that old, then what does it tell us? And it tells us some pretty uh, important information because as we would expect from something that older compared to any other squamates. Uh, it shows that some of the uh, features that we thought that were typical of squamates are actually only typical of the, the, the main group of squamates, what we call crown squamates. So that's pretty much all the extant families. Okay. Uh, plus a lot of the fossil ones as well that fit into those families. But that, uh, th- that those features do not actually characterize squamates as a whole. Uh, because the earliest members of squamates would actually lack those features. So, hmm. uh, for instance, uh, we know that most squamates, the excellent families, uh, they lack a quadratojugal bone, they lack belly ribs called gastralia, uh, they lack uh, a particular opening in the humerus called the antipicondylar foramen, mm-hmm. and uh, they and 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 Megacarella still preserves all of those features. Interesting. Still has. Uh, fused quadratojugal, gastralia, and condylar foramen. Uh, this particular, for, and, and it, it's not totally unexpected, so we have an early Cretaceous squamate, which is, it, although it's early Cretaceous, n- not as old as Megacarella, it, it is usually found in most analysis of squamate relationships, the one of the earliest evolving squamates, it's called Hue Hue Quetzpali from Mexico. And uh, that taxon still has some of those features, especially the antipicondylar front. Uh, but the megacarella, because it's older uh, and more uh, uh, 
basically placed in, in the phylogeny, then it's preserved even more features, and that includes the quadrature jugo in the, the Australia. So those are features that are common to all reptiles, apart mm -hmm. from spamids. Uh, and now we know that those features didn't uh, change as soon as squamates evolved. Actually, it was within the squamate lineage that those features eventually disappeared. Uh, and we have really complete squamates from the late Jurassic. Actually, prior to Megacurella, uh, finding Megacurella as the oldest known squamate, those late Jurassic taxa are the oldest known articulated and well-preserved squamates, uh, for which we know the osteology. So they, they are from Zohofen. Yeah. Uh, limestone is in Germany, a very well-known Lagerstatten, and uh, uh, those taxa, uh, which I actually had the opportunity to, to work on and re-describe last year, they lack uh, they already lack those features they don't have Kodratugo, they don't have Gastralia uh, so we, at some point between the Middle Jurassic and the Late Ju Middle, Middle Triassic and Late Jurassic uh, those features were lost, of course that's still a lot of time that's yeah. 80 million years so that pretty much tells us that we know through still of early climate evolution uh we, there's still a lot to, to cover from that time frame mm. uh but uh but pretty much mega Kerala, by giving us the first glimpse into these earliest stages of climate evolution answers uh, uh, a huge number of those questions that we had about what a, a very primitive climate would look like yeah. If we wanted to learn more about what was happening during that 70, 80 million years, where in the world would we look for fossils like that? Yeah, that's that's a good point. So, <laughs> uh, well, the Middle Triassic uh, and the Early Triassic, uh, the, the, there are some important localities in the world uh, for lepidosaurs, generally speaking, potentially for squamates as well. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, there is one locality in Poland uh, where uh, one species called Sofineta uh, was uh, found. And uh, Sofineta, in at least some of my analysis, it, it could be uh, an early as well. So uh, so uh, it, it, it's one of those complicated lepidosaurs. Nobody knew exactly where it uh, it could be an early climate as well. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, more study on the Polish uh, early Triassic fauna would be important. Yeah. The problem with that locality, uh, as well as other similar, uh, along with other localities, especially in the UK, late Triassic, early Jurassic localities in, in uh, Wales or uh, southwestern Britain, is that all of those localities, they are fissure fuel deposits, yeah. which pretty much means that you have uh, isolated bones of several different species uh, at the same level. Yeah. Uh, and the problem with that is you can't. You need to reconstruct the whole animal, uh, and, you, and mistakes can be made in that process. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so those localities are the most prolific in terms of number of fossils, but they are complicated in that sense. Yeah. So, in my opinion, it would be highly uh, important to actually find localities where we have articulated specimens for which yeah. we have no questions that those elements, those osteological features belong to the single specimen or single species at least. Uh, some of those localities may include the petrified forest mm. uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, uh, Triassic localities in South America, such as the Esquigualasa Formation in Argentina, the Santa Maria Formation in southern Brazil. Those localities have already proven to be extremely useful to understand the early evolution of dinosaurs. Uh, there are amazingly preserved dinosaurs, localities, and all your kind of archosaurs. But uh, we have not yet, and, and some lipidosaurs as well, uh, there is excellently preserved uh, sphenodontians there, uh, such as uh, Clevosaurus brasiliensis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 3D, there are 3D preserved fossils there. Uh, and so we know that if squamates were around in the Triassic, that it's quite possible that we could find 3D preserved squamates there as well. I actually think it's a matter of time. And uh, also uh, more researchers uh, looking for those because uh, we have a large number of vertebrate paleontologists who study mammals, dinosaurs, uh, but very few who actually study fossil squamates. Mm. And uh, you need to be specifically looking for those 
very very small bones uh, which could include squamid bones in order to uh, actually study them because we have a, a, a sort of research bias towards studying larger body or organisms or other kind of organisms uh, but people are rarely going to the field expecting or looking specifically for the very very small fossils uh, mm-hmm. or microfossils so uh, I think that now there is a uh, uh, more and more researchers trying to study squa- uh, fossil squamates, fossil lipidosaurs, and going to the field looking for them. Uh, and I think with uh, in the next decade, we will essentially start finding more Jurassic and Triassic uh, lipidosaurs. Hmm. So I guess another part of your study, or I guess <laughs> more the main part, was that you did you know a very large phylogenetic tree looking at relationships, but not just squamates. You also looked at kind of all diapsid reptiles or like a large group of diapsids. Can you explain a little bit about what you found that was different to previous studies or sort of the significance of what you found about diapsid reptiles as a whole? Sure, yeah. Uh, the main difference uh, has to do with taxonomic sampling, as I mentioned. Uh, in terms of diapsid uh, phylogenetic data sets, this is the one that includes the largest number of species. Uh, several previous studies have included uh, different diapsid reptile lineages at the family level. Uh, a few ones at the species level, especially uh, more recent data sets published to understand the relationships of turtles, for instance. But there are uh, still uh, groups highly underrepresented in some of those analyses, uh, squamates especially, uh, and other lipidosaurs. Uh, what I tried to do was to have at, at least two, three taxa uh, from every lineage. Sometimes I have four. I have uh, uh, four or five from each lineage. Uh, so I, I have more species for each major lineage, and I have every single major lineage, including marine reptiles, uh, mm. and all major clades of marine reptiles, which uh, not always have been included at the same time in uh, those particular uh, phylogenetic questions. Uh, and of course, most importantly, uh, a huge sampling of uh, squamates, which uh, makes a big difference. Uh, the, the other uh, main difference in the approach was that I actually uh, saw every single taxon, several specimens from every single taxon person. Mm. Uh, so I, I actually went to over 50 museum collections uh, and university collections in 17 countries uh, during really, really intensive sampling periods of my PhD time. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't at home for a long time, spending two or three months in a row on the, uh, on the road. Uh, including that one time when we met in Munich. I was going to say, that's exactly, <laughs> exactly when we met the first time, was both yeah. in collections at Munich. <laughs> exactly. Looking at Jurassic Squamates there. Uh-huh. Uh, exactly. So uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, actually, in the years of 2015 and 16, I spent a total of six months away uh, in each year, which basically means I was pretty much as far away as actually at my home <laughs> during that those years. So it was a lot of time uh, and money put into that mm. uh, to actually study. So even though I, my, most of my publication record has been on SQUAM, I spent a lot of time studying the anatomy all of, of all of those different groups uh, by myself uh, in different collections and using the literature as well. But uh, pretty much what I did was try to focus on seeing things by myself and two main reasons. One is uh, uh, accuracy, uh, studying only from publications and from pictures, mm-hmm. not the same things seen alive, mm-hmm. and efficiency, because you actually can do it, uh, you can score uh, information in a data set faster and more accurately when you're scoring those informations in your data set as you look at the specimens. Mm -hmm. So more than 75% of the taxa I actually scored in my data matrix while looking at them in those museums. So most of my data set was actually scored inside museum collections, Mm. looking at those specimens, not just from my pictures once I got back home or my notes, actually them. Of course, sometimes I had to change because I changed my mind about some things, Uh, but especially uh, doing in the museum collection. Mm 
And I think that's actually one very important practice uh, that really allows us to to be sure about what you're looking at something. It also gives you more data. Uh, lots of time publications don't really give you some details yeah. uh, about some particular informative characters you think would be actually quite important for your analysis, and it's just not mentioned, not, not illustrated, or sometimes it's a hand drawing, and hand drawings reconstructions can be highly read. Yeah. So it's really important to go and see if those particular specimens actually match the holotype. Mm-hmm. I, I try to sell whole types as well and uh, or, or as much as I uh, had access to and see if those match the holotype which bones actually are well preserved uh, preserved well enough so we can actually score them or not and finally uh, I had this study published in last year uh, in cladistics where I try to reassess uh, uh, current approaches towards character constructions in morphological data sets mm-hmm. and I put a lot of emphasis to avoid biological or logical uh, dependencies across characters or biases uh, in the way you build your characters, uh, focusing a lot on primary homology assets and so on. So it's a, it's a very uh, uh, technical and uh, uh, more met- methodology-based uh, paper, but um, it, it does change a lot how you, you see anatomic information and you try to code that in a way that is parsable uh, by a software and you can score that in zeros and ones in a way that uh, it doesn't overweight particular features or uh, create lots of dependent feature, uh, features which are dependent on, on each other. Um, I'm not the first one who who, who was addressing that. Mm-hmm. Lots of people have addressed that before, uh, but I was the first one bringing that up about to squamates uh, at, at that level uh, of debate mm. and I uh, and I, I try to incorporate that as much as possible in the way I was constructing my characters and uh, which particular approach I was having towards scoring my uh, uh, specimens as well. Just because I have to ask, you said that you sampled you know, a lot of different diapsids and tried to get all of the groups, but did you put pterosaurs into your I really wanted to. <laughs> <Of course laughs> so you I, didn't. I really no, I, I, I didn't just because I lack of time. Uh, I I really tried to sample as much as possible, <laughs> and I could have gone further into archosaurs and actually got as deep as early dinosaurs and uh, pterosaurs and crocodiles. I actually even have a list of taxa I wanted to see for that, <laughs> and I actually even saw some of those, including uh, dimorphodon. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, I uh, I just had to come back home at some point, and, and the money, I ran out of my time and money, and I had to finish a thesis. So uh, that, that's uh, part of my plans for the future. I guess that's a good excuse. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just quickly, going back to what you were saying about diapsids, one of the things that you mentioned in your paper is that diapsids evolved uh, not in the Triassic, but like much earlier on, is that something that's kind of new to your study? Like, I don't know, you know, for people who don't know exactly when the thought of diapsids evolving, is that pushing back diapsid origins or is that sort of what yeah. other people have said? Well, uh, not that many people said that. It's actually the opposite. So a lot okay. of people have defended that the origin of those groups was in the Triassic. Okay. But that's the sort of question that you know, that's the sort of issue that has been said a lot in the past without properly being addressed in, in analytical ways, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have lots of important fossils in the Triassic which are different from the Permian. Mm-hmm. That's what we had. And the logical conclusion for a long time uh, uh, was, well, then we had the origin of several new groups in the Triassic. And lots of these groups are the ones that give origin to, to important parts of the modern fauna, uh, including crocodiles, uh, squamates, uh, uh, lipidosaurs, uh, well, lipidosaurs. Uh, now, now we have the squamate, but mm-hmm. pre- previous lipidosaurs, marine reptiles, uh, uh, well, the extinct ones at least. So we have uh, uh, lots of new groups showing, showing up in the Triassic. So that's the information we got from the fossil record. Uh, and for a long time, that that was 
uh, uh, sort of the common knowledge in vertebrate evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, the oldest known fossil does not represent when, when the origin of that group actually occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best way to actually address that nowadays uh, that we have available is uh, to perform a co uh, is to co-estimate what is the best topological relationships across species, along with the inferred divergence times for those species, uh, along with other parameters such as the accumulated amount of pollution uh, over time, which we call the branch lengths, and uh, uh, and so on. So it's uh, uh, to do. We have uh, methods to do that with morphological data. And uh, we have uh, lots of different uh, studies in the last few years, in the last decade especially, trying to understand the divergence times or the origins for several different clades of animals, mm -hmm. and, and uh, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, spe and uh, we can do that. Nowadays, initially these these tools were developed for molecular data, but today we can do with even with fossil only data if we want. So uh, that's pretty much why I'm applying uh, in this study. Uh, I, uh, this is the first study that we do that for uh, such a large sample of diapsid reptiles, mm. uh, and certainly the first one that we include molecular data along with the morphological data to co that. So we have mm -hmm. lots of different sources of data. We have exantax, we have fossils, we have morphological data, we have molecules. So it's the most approach today to understand the divergence times for those reptile lineages. Mm -hmm. We also try to include some approaches that uh, uh, avoid some biases that we know that may happen in those uh, algorithms that estimate that. that and may provide two very old ages. So we had we are very careful to avoid uh, having very old ages uh, uh, in our approaches, and uh, we still had the origin all of of most of the diapsid groups prior to the Permian Triassic extinction. Hmm. Uh, to be fair, uh, at the same time, we we do have we always had some of those earliest occurrences of those clades really, really early in the Triassic. Okay. So uh, this Triassic red has fossils of ichthyosaurs, sauropter regions, uh, archosaurs, uh, really early middle Triassic of lipidosaurs. Uh, there is a recent paper proposing already uh, archosaur fossils in the late Permian. Hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, if, if you have the oldest known fossils from the early Triassic, it, it's quite plausible that it could have originally prior to that. Yeah. Uh, and that debate actually has already permeated some some uh, researchers in particular taxonomy groups, uh, such as ichthyosaurs, for instance. Uh, there has been uh, previous proposals that they actually originated in the Permian, mm. not your um, uh, So there, there, there I, of course, I'm not the first one to propose that, but pretty much the, the general idea is that most of those groups originated in the Triassic, uh, but there have been very few studies trying to actually address that with actual analytical mm. tools uh, that incorporate all of those uh, uh, sources of evidence and trying to uh, utilize the most uh, uh, precise and up-to-date methodologies we have available. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so in that in that sense, uh, it's uh, let's say the most accurate estimation we mm. have at at the moment. So now we need to find a Permian clear diapsid. Yes, <laughs> we we certainly can find some of those. Uh, we we do have uh, Permian diapsids. Yeah, uh, but in, I guess for, I... for some groups. Yeah, of the other groups. Notosaurus. Uh, yeah. Notosaurus, which yeah. has made headlines in nature before, it's a, a Permian turtle. So we have for some groups already uh, quite well established uh, Permian uh, species, but we still lack for some taxa. Yeah. Uh, it's quite possible we will eventually find a uh, Permian uh, lipidosaurus, uh, 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 spe specifically uh, even Permian 
squam its Enrico's Italians. Uh, it's probably a matter of time, but it, it also depends on the preservation bias of the fossil record, right? It's it's uh, sometimes we just don't have the rocks, the correct rocks available, uh, mm. or people with access to those rocks, or yeah. uh, the rocks available were not in the environment where those species occurred. So yeah. we may not find them. We may find them. It's uh, it's difficult uh, to know. Uh, but one thing for sure that is clear is that those different groups of diapsid, they really diversified a lot in the Triassic. Uh, they probably were uh, not as diverse. They probably were much more restricted in diversity in the Permian. Uh, and that's probably one of the we don't find so many of those in the Permian. Mm. Uh, so one of the, the ideas that we throw in the paper is that, that the origin is prior to the Permian Triassic extinction, mm -hmm. but the main diversification period was after that. Uh, so that's why we got those fossils in the Triassic and not in the uh, late Permian, hmm. for instance. Interesting. Uh, just to kind of finish up at the end, uh, where, where do you think is the next sort of big topic or question that we should be looking at in terms of diapsid phylogeny, squamates, this kind of whole topic? What do you think is the next most important thing? Uh, well, I, I've, I'm really interested in several different areas of research in, all of, uh, in, in those groups. And I think uh, to better understand early squamate lipidosaur evolution, which, uh, as we demonstrate, has a deep impact on diapsid evolution, we certainly need to explore more Triassic and Jurassic localities, mm -hmm. uh, as we discussed, because we really lack more fossil information from those time frames. Mm. And that's a lot of time. There is a lot of rocks uh, in several different countries that can be explored. So uh, I'm pretty sure we are, we're gonna be finding a lot of quite interesting things in those rocks uh, uh, and which will answer uh, s s of questions still uh, out there, mm -hmm. uh, such as there, there are, pro for instance, I'm. I'm uh, I I believe that we have several extinct families of squamates that we don't know of. We know some of the late Cretaceous extinct families, such as uh, polyglyphanodontids that inhabited North America and Eastern Asia. Mm -hmm. But we know that because we have a really f a rich record of fossil squamate mutations. Uh, and especially because the origin of most of the extinct families are is in the Cretaceous or late Jurassic, Imagine what we can find in the earliest Jurassic or late Triassic. Mm. There's probably entire extinct. There is probably entire lineages of fossil squamates and uh, other groups of reptiles. We're, we're completely uh, completely clueless right yeah. now, especially in the case of squamates. Uh, there might be entirely new body plans uh, that we never thought of in the early evolution of squamates, which we just don't know yet. Uh, so I think there is a lot of opportunities of research over there. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for talking with me, Tiago, and congratulations on your new paper. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Nice talking to you. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.